Salut, Jones. Comment vas-tu Ça va Ça va. Très bien. Je suis vraiment désolé, mais je ne parle pas français. That's why this lecture is going to be in English. Sorry. Yes. I mean, I, I, I do speak a little French, but I don't want to butcher your beautiful language, so please excuse me. Uh, I'll be butchering English because it's not my mother tongue either. Uh, yes. Very nice. So, you came to this room because I, have your, I guess you have questions, right? You have questions about like uh, Java, like what's, what's happening to Java, uh, what will be happening to Java. Uh, but I guess the question you're asking yourself right now is, what the heck is this guy's name? Uh, yes. So, uh, I'm Piotr Przybył. Uh, apparently, uh, Y or Y in Polish is a vowel, right? Yeah, because, fun fact, I'm Polish, I live in Poland, I was born in Poland, I work from Poland. I'm uh, all Polish as far as I can tell. Uh, yes, and the talk today is about what happened to Java 19 and 20. We will take a little peek about what's going to happen in Java 21. Uh, this is a deep dive talk, by the way, which means it's going to last 120 minutes, uh, which means I will running some demos and whatnot, right? So if you're looking for like quick overview session, this is not this session, so you can like a YouTube another session of mine for a quick overview. This time in this room, we are trying to get a bit deeper, hence this uh, diver here, right? So we're going to dive into this interesting stuff. I hope. Yes, uh, shortly about me, uh, like I'm a software gardener. Um, if you don't know who Software Gardener is, uh, I recommend you read this fantastic book called Pragmatic Programmer. It explains uh, way better than I could who Software Gardener is, right? It's, it's like, a, so it's not just a job, it's a mindset, I would say. I'm also a trainer, like I train people how to use uh, various things. Uh, like, I can't see my laptop because of this, so normally what I do is this, it's Java, it's test containers, I'm a, like, a, I would say, hardcore backend guy. Uh, from time to time I publish some stuff on my personal web page called softwaregarden.dev. Um, that's why I also like when it rains, like today, right? I mean, I'm sorry, like it's, it's, your, it's your national holiday, right? And it rains, so it's not good for fireworks, but for the plants it's awesome, trust me. Uh, yes, this is me doing Java, and I realized this yesterday, that I'm doing Java for almost 20 years. Yes. Uh, in, in fall, it will be 20 years when I started doing, uh, working in Java. So I started working in Java 1.3, backported some code to 1.2, uh, which means I've seen quite a few versions of Java uh, being released, I would say. Uh, yes, so this is about me. Question is, who are you, lovely people? Right. Who's, who's programming in Java? Okay, very nice. Uh, who's not programming in Java, but who's just curious? Very nice. I love you folks too. Very nice. Okay. Uh, any other JVM languages like Kotlin, Scala, Groovy, Clojure? Oh, I'm surprised. Okay. Okay. So among Java people, who's working in, in, in Java 20? <laughs> two, 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 three people. Okay. 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 Uh, I was hoping for more, but since, uh, since you're in this, uh, you didn't raise your hand, you're in the right room. Very nice. Who's doing Java 17? Okay. Java 11, okay, Java 8, okay, Java, Java 7, anyone? <laughs> Please don't be shy. No, really, it's, it's like uh, once you make it to Java 11, then it's, then it's rolling. We all know that migration to Java 9 was probably the most painful one, because some is kind of safe and other stuff, right? Uh, but yeah, uh, okay, so we know each other. Hello, very nice to see you. Um, yes, a little warning. Um, I'm just a human being. I can make mistakes. Everyone can make mistakes, right? So don't trust talking heads, especially on the internet. Uh, if you're watching us on, on YouTube later or, or like other platforms, right? Verify things on your on your own. Uh, yes. Um, so maybe we should start with a little riddle. This is the code. Because this is the, the, the spirit of this talk, right? I could just show slides and you could just... Very nice, right? Uh, let's, let's run some code and see how it uh, works. So who can tell me that if I, what will be the output of this code uh, if I run it on, uh, on Java 20? What will it print? Or maybe... Sorry? Very nice. 
You got jellies? Oh, nice. These are jellies from Poland, yes. Uh, so now you know how to win some jellies. Yes, it says, hello, this is Java 20. Yeah, that's how it works. So we can like have a peek how uh, like, there, are, there are going to be some changes um, to Java, right? To, to, to Java code. Uh, very nice. Java 19, it got released in September last year. It had seven JEPs in total. And here are the release notes. So you are more than welcome to fetch the slides or just Google for the release notes. And then you scroll page after page after page, right? And when you're done scrolling, you can think, OK, maybe it was a better idea to go to this uh, Polish guy's talk, right? Because this is what I do. I, I, I've read that. I presented some demos so we don't have to read these release notes, right? That's the whole point for today. And for Java 20, it was released half a year later, because fun fact, the train leaves now every six months, right? So if a feature makes it to the train, it lives in that train. If it didn't make it on time to the release station, then it's, it has to wait for another train. And that's it. So these days, Java releases aren't postponed by some features or whatnot, right? Again, it has seven jobs in total, and you have release notes. And we expect Java 21 to be released in September this year, right? Uh, so here are the JEPs of Java 19, and as you can see, except this new port for RISC for uh, Linux, everything else is in preview or uh, as an incubator, right? Uh, meaning something that's experimental, that's something that can change, and something you have to opt in to, to use in your source code and in your runtime, right? And for Java 20, it got even more interesting because everything is incubator or preview. Right? These seven jobs, they are listed. I mean, you have the numbers and the names. So I guess that would be all. Thank you very much. Go for the release notes. Yeah. Of course, I'm, I'm trolling you. Uh, so, are you asking yourself this question? Shall I abandon the latest LTS and then migrate to Java 20? Of course, this is the answer. Yes, you should be using the latest GVA. GVA. They're taking pictures. Come on. I need to like look like really like strong. You know this uh, Arnold documentary? Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I'm not that fit, unfortunately. I'm getting older and older. Okay. So yes, you have to be using or should be using by default the latest Java in production, right? Not maybe the the uh, like the uh, features from the source code, right? But at least have your jar deployed using latest uh, GDK, uh, unless you have really valid reasons not to do that. Okay, you, ha you need to have excuse not to do that. You don't need to have reason to do that. Okay, it's the opposite. Your default mindset should be to like update your uh, Docker images or whatever you use every uh, six months and, and say like from Java 20 and stuff like this. Okay, uh, unless you have, as I said, a really, really good excuse. Um, yes, because non LTS doesn't mean banana soft or monkey soft or anything like this. Okay, LTS. And please don't quote me on this. Basically, it's a business term. It means that if your company has some extra money and they want to pay someone, so when you have issues with Java and you dial a number, there's somebody else paid who can pick up the phone and say, yes, what is your problem? Right? This is what LTS means, that for this Java release, they will be picking up the, uh, the, uh, the phone uh, for, for a longer period of time. Okay. It's, it's about support. It's not that these, these, these releases that which are like labeled as LTS are better, I mean, better tested, are more secure, I don't know, superior in any technical way. It's, it's not the case. And I don't know if you know this, it, LTS really depends on the, on the vendor, right? So we, in general, think about the Oracle when it comes to LTS or something like this. But, uh, for example, Azul is doing the LTSs in a different manner. So they used to support, for example, Java 13 and 15 for longer than six months because they can, right? If you pay them money, of course. Uh, so this is it. So LTS doesn't mean it's better in a technical way. So if you're not paying anyone, okay, it, there's no reason to stick to LTS unless you want to pay more. And we'll get to that. There's, there's been a change to LTS uh, cadence, uh, which means it's not going to be six, every six releases, but every four releases, which means Java 21 in September this year, okay, at the end of this summer, which began yesterday at uh, 1658 uh, precisely, uh, we will have new Java release, right? And it will be LTS according, I mean, to, to, to Oracle. Uh, yeah. So in short, 
there are no new language syntax or there have been no new language syntax in the la latest two Java versions, Java 19 and 20, unless as a, we, we take into account the, the, the preview ones. So there are changes as a preview, right, but not as a standard feature. Uh, there are changes to concurrency, uh, there are changes to processing data, especially if we talk about records, right? Uh, there's still ongoing story with the native stuff. Uh, how do we natively manage memory and do native calls, right, of, of, of various um, you know, C libraries? And yeah, so who's been using preview features? Okay, that's why I can't skip this part. Okay, preview feature is something you have to opt in uh, at two stages, when you compile your code and when you run your code, or uh, shall I say, when your code is run, okay? That's why if you release your software on-premises, so you release, for example, I don't know, Docker files, or I mean, Docker files, okay, so let's say jars, like ordinary jars, then uh, it's usually not a good idea because the version of the source code uh, has to match the version of the runtime, uh, right, if you're using preview features, and also uh, people who are, who are running your jar also have to uh, opt in using dash dash enable preview. So it goes down basically to this dash dash enable preview. How do you set this in Gradle? Uh, more or less like this for compa compilation, for testing, and if you run your stuff, you need to have this enable uh, preview added. For Maven, we have something similar like uh, like this in here. And normally it works quite well in IntelliJ, but it might be you're, you're not using Maven or Gradle or anything like this, or you have some hiccups, I don't know, it, it takes indexing and indexing for too long. Then you have to select it manually uh, from, from settings in IntelliJ, right? So in case you decided to, for example, clone my repositories and it doesn't work somehow, please make sure that it's really selected as a, as a preview uh, version, right, in your IDE. If you need to know more how it's uh, working under the hood, uh, how it's written to class files and whatnot, shameless plug for me, uh, go and watch this uh, piece of the video from, uh, from uh, DevOx Belgium. Okay, so concurrency. <coughs> very nice. There was a very nice session about Project Loom uh, earlier today in the room uh, across the corridor, right? Um, yeah, so, but maybe you haven't been there, so let me uh, recap. So. As you may know, platform or operating system threads might be slow to create, right? Back in the day, several years ago, if, you, if your system had to do something in parallel, the way was to fork a process, basically to spin a new process, right? But that, it introduced some, some issues. We had zombie processes, we had orphan processes, and so on and so on. Um, and it was really not efficient. So we said, okay, it would be faster and better and more efficient if we go for threads. So we went for threads. And we followed this nice approach, thread per request, uh, sorry, request per thread, yeah, something like this. Basically, every task, every computational task was given its own thread, right? And it seemed to be quite okay until we've reached uh, these uh, issues again that uh, we cannot have enough threads or that threads are also slow to create, to spin off, right? If you have to respond in a few milliseconds, you cannot afford spending that much time on creating new, uh, or, or telling operating system, hey, give me a new thread, right? Because it's taking too much. So we like created like thread pools and, and, and React approach and other techniques to, to, to like, uh, you know, uh, detour this, uh, these programs, right? Um, yeah, there's a limited number of them, hence this thread per request uh, model is not so popular these days. And who's been trying to uh, debug or troubleshoot reactive stack? Okay, there's two hands, three hands raised, four. Keep your hands raised, fifth. Keep your hands raised if you did that without IntelliJ. Yeah, are you guys able to glue these stack traces like manually or using piece of paper? Piece of paper, it's not easy, right? Ex exactly. Uh, so such async systems are really difficult to reason about. Uh, and in Java also we don't have something that our friends, for example, in JavaScript have, like async and await, right? So we have to rely on the uh, uh, threading model or something uh, like uh, using it. So here it is. Maybe you have heard about them. 
virtual threads, I mean, everyone speaks about virtual threads uh, these days when it comes to Java. Uh, they are part of the project Loom, and it's quite fortunate that we speak uh, about them. Then, and the name is virtual threads, and it seems that the, the name is going to stick. In the past, we were talking about fibers and whatnot. I mean, the concept, there were, there were several ideas how to implement the concept, uh, how to name the concept, and so on. So these days, it's called virtual threads, right? Um, yes, and there is this question, people ask this question, is this the biggest change since Lambda? And some people say yes. This is clearly the biggest change since introduction of Lambda, Lambda in Java 8. And some people say, no, bullshit, this is even bigger. And I can't tell, right, we'll see. Uh, but for sure it's, a, it's going to be a big change, so it's quite fortunate you're in this room, uh, then you won't miss this train, right? Uh, so, virtual threads, uh, what are they? They are described, uh, or they are still uh, or in Java 20 as a second preview feature, uh, but don't get fooled, they got developed over several years. It took quite a while. Uh, this is the JEP, so the documentation. The JEP is quite lengthy, but I really recommend going uh, and reading it. I love these uh, alternative sessions in these JEPs, uh, right? And what virtual threads are great for? Maybe you've heard some of these ideas. They're great for debugging because they are still threads, right? Uh, the maintainers of Java didn't re re introduce another model. They didn't go to like uh, uh, coroutines or go routines or just routines or, or continuations like us in with, with a new API or anything like this. They're still relying on the thread model, which means people who've been uh, working in Java for 20 years, just like me, don't have to learn like a new concept or new API, right? We can rely on what we already know. We don't have to update the books, the libraries and everything and therefore they're also good for debugging. Uh, they're very good for switching. Uh, I mean, the, uh, when you have to switch uh, uh, tasks, provided that the tasks are switchable, and they're extremely good at waiting. Uh, and they're good at waiting because if you do it properly, they don't wait. That's, that's the beauty of it. And they're also good for reducing memory consumption in general. I mean, this is not always granted, right? Uh, and, and in some cases, it, it, may, it might not be the, uh, the case, uh, but usually uh, this is how they behave. And yeah, so uh, yeah, so not, uh, we uh, shouldn't reinvent the wheel, keep the threading model. And how do they work? Um, okay, cities, especially in Europe, right? You know that our cities are congested by cars, by traffic, right? And if everyone, and in, in perfect world, we would have endless resources, and just like in US, we could add, like grow our cities, you know, outside and outside, outside. It's, it's not possible, right? Because fun fact, you can't grow the cities inside. You can't add more lanes. You can't add more parking spaces, right? Because there is not enough space. Uh, so we can't have a, like a we can't have a model that everyone, every person that lives in a city and around the city has a car and can use it at the very same time, right, uh, when we go whatever they want to without any hiccups, traffic jams, looking for parking spaces and so on, right? So what we can have instead is, the, for example, car sharing or just taxis. Let's say after this uh, wonderful event, you decide to go with your friends uh, to a restaurant uh, to have a dinner, right? And instead of driving the, each of, and every one of you in, in your own car, uh, you call a taxi, and the taxi, so we have a need, right, to do some, let's say, computation or remove yourself from, from here to, to the restaurant. You go there by, by taxi, and when you, you get there, you just pay the, the driver, right, and, and they can go and, and drive uh, other people to other locations. You enjoy your dinner, right, you have great time, and when you need to get somewhere else, for example, back to your home, or I don't know, or another restaurant because uh, national holiday and, and great party, right? Then you call taxi or Uber or Bolt or whatever you have again, right? And uh, so you express the need that, hey, I need some resource, and they take you from this place B to place C and so on, right? This is how it works. And this is how virtual threads are working. Virtual threads are going to dine in a restaurant, and whenever they uh, need to get there, they basically call for a carrier thread, which is like a regular open source, sorry, operating system slash platform thread, right? And uh, when they have something to compute, they gre they, they, they greedy, they, 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 they keep the uh, carrier thread uh, occupied, right? And then when there's like so waiting for some IO network uh, or so on, uh, they release the carrier thread and the carrier thread, just like a taxi, can, can drive another virtual thread, right? This is how it more or less works. Uh, they're cheap to start. 
uh, they, are, they are much smaller. They are more or less implemented as continuations. Um, yeah, they unmount the carrion thread uh, when they're waiting for the I.O. And they're always demons uh, with no more priority. Actually, I could show you, uh, I should have a code for this. Let's see. Uh, I like this approach that when you have something new you'd like to discover or to explore, you write some tests just to make sure you understand how the system or new API works, right? So we have this virtual thread stiff test. Let me make sure that it's still running and passing. Uh, yes, so let's go through this. See, uh, whenever I want to um, uh, call on a virtual thread, this is virtual thread, uh, call uh, stop, suspend, resume, it's going, throw me, it's going to throw me unsupported operation exception. And uh, when I want to set it to be not daemon, uh, like a, so a thread that will uh, block the execution of, 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 of the program, right? Uh, then it will tell me or throw me in legal argument exception. Uh, when I tell it to be daemon, it says, yeah, whatever, I'm still a daemon, so not a big deal, right? This is basically no op. And so is this. When you set another priority than no more, it will have no, no effect. It will still uh, be a normal priority thread. Nothing changes here. And here in Java 19 and 20, you could like opt out from uh, thread local variables, but it's not going to be part of Java 21, as far as I can tell. Hence, let's keep that part, right? Uh, yeah, and they allow perhaps this thread per request nicely. Uh, let me show you another piece of code. Uh, yes, uh, virtual threads, virtual thread li thre threads limits. Very nice. Okay, so here I am emulating uh, that my threads will be working for six seconds. And don't do that at home, and for sure don't do that at produ in production, right? I'm using thread sleep because it's demo. Uh, and it's it's silly, and I don't want to like uh, I don't know uh, compute Fibonacci numbers or, or or check for prime numbers or anything like this, right? Um, yeah. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do this extremely naive benchmarkish way. It's not a proper benchmark, right? So uh, we're going to record the start time. Then I'm going to try to run thirty thousand threads. Then I'm going to create these threads, you know, in a loop. Then I'm going to start the threads. Every 5k uh, threads, I'm going to show what's the current number, right? And then we are going to wait for the last uh, thread. And how do I create the thread? It's quite easy. I have this blocking operation, and I just create a new thread, right? Uh, just as we used to. And this is a blocking operation. I just sleep for six seconds, OK? So do you think I'm able to run 30,000 threads like this on my machine? No. Like a good old fashioned platform threads. We, we don't have to guess. That's the beauty of a deep dive. Let's run this demo and find out, OK? That's the beauty of it. We can be proper engineers. We can see if it works, right? If it works, if it doesn't work, right? Because we have some time. It seems that I was able to start this 30K, and it's like. Um, you know, waiting six seconds. But please notice one thing. Um, I was, uh, so each thread was supposed to wait for six seconds, right? But we had 30,000 of them, so therefore the whole process took like 11 seconds, right? So it gives you, it's not the proper benchmark, it gives you get an idea how long the overhead takes of this, right? I was able to run it. Okay, uh, let's try to run uh, 40,000 perhaps. On my machine, it, I mean, results may vary on, on your machine. If you clone the repository and running on your own, it might be different on your machine. Your millage may vary. And kaboom, it didn't work. Exit code one. What do you think happened? Out of memory exception, very nice. Uh, did I give you a chance already? OK, but this is like great. You get another one. OK, you can share. Out of memory exception, exactly, because each thread reserves a certain piece of RAM or memory for, for its thread stack, right? And of course, I could, I could uh, tune the parameters, I could make it smaller and so on, but still there will be a limit, right? And this is actually what has happened. I need to scroll. Oh my gosh, there are so many of these errors. Ooh, but it should be somewhere in here. Yes, not enough space, 
right? And yeah, out of memory error basically. Um, uh, yeah, unable to create a possibly out of memory uh, process resources limits reach, right? It also depends on like operating system and whatnot. So it's not going to work like this. So if you happen to have an extremely successful system, right, uh, that it, it, in its peaks it can reach, you see that many requests, you're not able to handle it this way, right? So then you go for a reactive approach, then you have to handle back pressure and whatnot. Or starting Java 21, uh, which is going to happen in three months from now, you can switch, or, or in, like currently in Java, but let's preview feature, you can switch to virtual thread. So I can use this builder and I'm saying like create thread or virtual and unstart it, right? And I'm going to uh, start it uh, then uh, in, in here. Now the question is, do you think it will work or not? Yeah, it, it, will, it will work, but let's run. Yeah, I, I like your approach, yeah. I, I hope it will, it will run, else, I mean, what would be the purpose of this demo, right? That would derail the whole presentation. Um, it seems it's working. Uh, see, and this is how little overhead we had, right? So the last, so we're waiting for the last thread for sure for six seconds, and this is more or less the overhead. And mind you, we're not at 30,000, but at 40,000 threads, right? Uh, so when you see, they are cheap and easy to create. And what do you think? How many threads can I fit in? 100,000. Okay, you say 100,000. 100,000, like this. No, it's, it's like this, right? Okay, I say, let's try with a million. I mean, it's casino, right? So like little gambling. It's innocent gambling. Um, And uh, ooh, yeah, it worked. Slightly more overhead, so it seems that you know, creating a million virtual threads is not like absolutely free. It takes it takes some time, right? Uh, so we reached almost uh, like 10 seconds mark, right? But still, um, it may seem quite impressive, right? So if you have something like this, right? You see, we can go from like 30, it, from, at my machine uh, with default settings, it like crashes with some th somewhere around 32,000 uh, threads. And we can go for 1 million threads and I could go for more. Uh, I guess it's just, we should stop somewhere. I guess it's one of these Yacht problems, right? If we have 1 million requests reaching our system within 10 seconds, I mean, we'd be so rich that we could hire some, some guys that could do that for us, right? So let's stop here. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just interrupt me in the middle, right? Let's not wait till the, till the very end. Uh, yes, so this is how they can uh, scale up, you see. Uh, and then uh, all your frameworks and everything can still rely on this threading model because uh, as you can see from here, it's uh, when I create a thread, it's just a thread. It doesn't know if it's virtual or not, right? Um, Yes. So it's also like for debugging and troubleshooting because you have like thread locals because you have uh, stack traces and whatnot, right? So it's a good old uh, fashioned uh, thread we, we know. Uh, and therefore, as you can see, as I was hoping to demonstrate, we can improve the scalability of for the asynchronous approach uh, using the, uh, the threads, right? And one thing you, I'd like you to remember is that there is no magic switch to turn your system uh, so it could start using virtual threads, okay? There is no dash D something, there is no dash XX something. You have to go to your source code and just as I did here, see, you have to, instead of creating uh, good old threads like this or using this builder which is equivalent of this, I have to switch for, uh, for a new uh, threads, right? Hence, you will need to recompile your code to be Java 21 or Java uh, 19 with preview features, at least, okay? So you, you need to recompile your, your jars, or like you have new jars, basically. Uh, you, so you need to touch your source code, and this is uh, one of the ways of creating a virtual thread, the, the minimal way, uh, the shortest one, I guess. Unless you're happy trading one dot for uh, two extra characters, then it's this. Uh, yep, 
And if you need uh, executors, uh, you can go for a new virtual thread per task. Let's keep this per task important. And uh, if you need factory, you create factory like this, right? So this is how you enable or start using virtual threads in your, in your code. If there's the most important thing I'd like you to remember from this talk is this, is that virtual threads won't magically squeeze more juice from your uh, CPU or from your local silica, okay? It might seem, and it, it, I guess in majority of cases, it will be the case that virtual threads will look like, ooh, it's much faster, unless you're in this unhappy situation when it's not. Uh, because of the properties uh, and the quirks of, and the way uh, virtual threads got implemented, right? So your millage might vary, and I really in insist that you test your, your system under the load to see if it's not degrading its performance, because there might be cases when it's actually uh, giving you worse results using virtual threads than good old uh, threads, uh, right? So. How they how they implement it? Um, they implement it more or less as continuations, which means they are not GC roots. But when a virtual thread uh, like went to a restaurant, right, uh, its data is copied to the stack uh, for uh, sorry the, the the hip, right, not the stack but the hip. See, uh, and uh, then it's copied back uh, again when the when the thread wants to go from restaurant back home, for example, right. Uh, which means this is more work for garbage collector. So they can cre introduce this way more pressure for, for garbage collection because they, 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 they're moving the memory from instead of having, I don't know, one or two megabytes on stack, they, they're having, I don't know, uh, several hundred uh, bytes on, on the heap. So they, ha they use less memory in total and they're not using it from like basically the, the other region of the, of the memory of, of this, like whatever you see. It. And they don't guarantee first CPU usage, they're greedy. So just in a taxi, right? You, you, like when you get in the taxi, and as long as you're sort of paying or you have like uh, money to cover the ride, the, the driver will drive you whatever you want to and for how long you, you want to. I mean, I assume that eventually you stop driving for, I don't know, like after two days or something, right? But there is no that moment that the driver will, will say, okay, you are paying me nicely, you're a nice passenger, but now get out because I want to like drive other people around. It's not going to happen. It's the virtual threat, the passenger, that needs to say, okay, I'm letting you go and drive other people, other virtual threats, right? And this is the slight, some people say it's a problem of virtual threats because the corporation, the taxi corporation or the driving company is called fork joint pool, right? So it has a limited number of forks. As of today, we're not able to create at least in official builds. Uh, and a mo uh, like a, a modern builds uh, provide like virtual threads our own thread pool. It's relying on the on the fork joint pool, right? Which means uh, which means for example, if you're using uh, stream dot parallel somewhere, right? Uh, it it can also degrade your performance, right? And for example, if you have lengthy requests and the requests are in like re uh, releasing. The, the threads from forging pool to be able to drive another virtual threads, you, you might see, for example, that they're greedy and they, that your performance might go down. And yes, they live in user space, not in kernel space. Therefore, if they go uh, like uh, into taxi, out of taxi, into taxi, out of taxi, like mounting and mounting, mounting and mounting the carrier thread uh, from forging pool, uh, you might have cache misses basically from CPU, because now it will be different uh, CPU core uh, uh, computing this uh, virtual thread, right? So this might also be important. Therefore, I say it's a, it, it won't be a saver or silver bullet for, silver bullet for every system of yours, okay? Uh, you need to check, basically, uh, if it's uh, working okay. Yes, so people tell you what, like, this, this is how we can use virtual threads, and Loom is so cool, so awesome, so nice, and so on, but there are things perhaps you shouldn't be doing with virtual threads, okay? And what are these? You shouldn't reuse them. As you've seen, they are so cheap and easy to start, you should be basically uh, creating a new one whenever you need a virtual thread. That's why this executor is called new thread per task, right? Hence the name. Uh, you, we shouldn't pull them. Right? We used to pull the, uh, threads in general, or have like pull uh, execution uh, services, right? Just to uh, handle uh, the the most basic way uh, the back pressure. Okay, for example, now it's like it, it's not wise. So we need to have another mechanism, uh, like to, to to make sure that you like you're not blowing your your thing up, that you like stop before the the limit, right? Not just pull the virtual threads, and we shouldn't pin virtual threads. 
pinning virtual threats, it's like uh, the situation that happens in these poor gangster movies, okay? So uh, there's a bunch of folks, they're going to rob the bank, right? And one of them stays in the car, and the big boss goes uh, to the bank with a few other uh, criminals, and they tell the driver, keep the engine running, okay? So uh, basically, they want the, the car to, to stay uh, there to be instantly ready for them to, to drive them away from the crime scene, okay? And in uh, terms of virtual threats, it's called pinning, and you pin virtual threat uh, when you are doing um, native operation or uh, uh, any I.O. operation inside synchronized block. And this is like the slight problem that we might have, or slight, I don't know, maybe it's going to be a big problem, with the frameworks or libraries we currently use, right? We might happily think or naively think, I'm just provide this framework with virtual threads, okay, and it will be, and it will be faster. But maybe this framework somewhere down there is using blocking operations uh, like blocking I.O. inside synchronized blocks. And therefore, because of the limited number of the fork join pools, you will see performance downgrade, okay? So for example, for up, up to eight requests, uh, eight concurrent requests or 16 concurrent requests, depending on the machine, it might be blazing fast, but then it may go pfft, bananas, basically. And how to detect that? Because it's important. So there's this switch. Uh, you can go for JDK trace uh, pin threads full, uh, or you can record for Java flight recorder events. And I'd like to run this experiment with you. Uh, so I have prepared this uh, lab code because health and safety, and you never know, things may blow. I mean, the demo gods may be not always with us. So please stay with me. I forgot my protection glasses, but I hope this screen won't explode. Okay, so let's do the experiment. Let's do the following. Do you have microservices, people? You don't have, you, 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 you won't get jealous because you're a happy man. Okay, uh, you, you need to shine another approach. Okay, does anyone in the room have microservices? Yeah, there are some of us who have microservices, yeah. And let's say we have this Gritter microservice that is using HTTP client, and this HTTP client is operated by threads, like the thread pool or something, and it's going to call something out there in the internet, let's say grab like a file we pointed to, and count how many bytes are there or something. I mean, this is just to emulate like a proper network uh, call in your system, right? Uh, and then, so this is it. It's, it's calls, it calls this, uh, this thing, and we want to make sure that after we switch uh, this thing to be handled not by ordinary uh, threads, but by virtual threads, it's not going to be slower, that the threads is, are not going to be pinned. And how do we test that? A th virtual thread is pinned when, it, uh, when the engine is running on idle for more or less 20 milliseconds, if I'm not mistaken. So if it's running for more than 20 milliseconds, it's, it's, it's con we say that virtual thread pinned the carrier thread. So how do we test that, right? We test that like this. We can use Toxiproxy, which is a great technology if you need to emulate network. How do you test your network in your Maven Gradle CI build? In production, yeah, exactly. And this is what troubles me, right? This is what troubles me. So, fun fact, whenever I see people having um, issues in like production with network, I go and prescribe more integration tests. Yeah, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to write integration tests for virtual threads, right, for our solution. So, uh, fun fact, I'm going to use uh, test containers for this, right? So, we're going to create three test containers, right? Put our stuff into one container, then put the network sort of in another container to call the stuff that's running in a yet another container. So, we're going to bring three containers to see how things are working. And I should have code for this. Uh, let me see this thing. Yeah, okay. It's, it's, it's quite simple. Let me walk you through. Okay, we, should, we have to enable this. And we should also like rebuild uh, our, our thing. Yeah, like this. Let it build in the, in the, in the meantime. Okay, uh, so I have this index HTML file in my resources and I'm going to copy it to this Nginx container, right? So I'm starting two containers concurrently. Uh, first it is this uh, Nginx container, and I copy this file here, and then I create this toxic proxy container to emulate like a um, network with issues, basically, right? 
and then I start both of them in parallel, uh, as you can see, and then I create this uh, this arrow, basically. I need to create this arrow which is guaranteed to be pinning virtual threads, right? Uh, should they be misused. So, I'm copying uh, the thing I've created, my system, sort of, uh, to a container which is going to use uh, OpenJDK. So, this thing, I'm putting it into container like this, copying the jar file here, and then I start the container as well. And then, I get the URL from uh, from Toxy Proxy. Like basically, I need to tell this guy, "Hey, you need to follow this path, right?" So this is this path, and then I want to assert uh, a thing that when I run this uh, my, my my thing with enable preview because it's still Java 20, and when I use this switch from the slides, right, I don't see uh, on pinned in the in system output, right, in standard output, um, and let's let's run the code and let's see if it works. Uh, sorry, wrong, uh, wrong demo. Okay, so uh, yeah, and now it will be time for dad jokes. Okay, so I've learned a beautiful dad joke uh, yesterday at, in Utrecht. Okay, why didn't they starve on the desert? They had sandwiches. Yeah, these Dutch people. I mean, it's so bad, right? <laughs> It's so bad. This joke is so bad that I love it. Yeah, as you can see, the test has passed. We didn't pin any of our virtual threads. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's so bad. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so we could happily, I think, deploy it to production. However, let's see if we can cause it fail. Or what? What would it take? See, I have this greeting obtainer. So this is this micro microservice part, right? And as you can see, I'm calling the network operation here using the HTTP client, uh, right? And let's say that I'm gonna make it, uh, sorry, uh, oh, come on, sorry, wrong key, this key. I'm gonna make it um, in, inside synchronized block or method, right? So now let me uh, recreate my, um, mm -hmm. My jar, and let's run uh, the test again. Okay, so it's time for another dad joke. You don't have any, any sea or ocean in Luxembourg, right? So, do you do what one ocean said to another ocean when they met? No, they didn't say anything. They just waved. <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. Okay, the test didn't pass, right? And should that be your build environment? Uh, okay, so it's Thursday today, so what would we could possibly do? We could like put some debug one, debug two statements, right? A git push force, everything, and tomorrow we come after the whole build pipeline and we still see it doesn't work, right? Because the test doesn't pass, because it says something and it's so cryptic that it's, let's forget about it. And here's the beauty of test containers in integration tests run on your machine, because what I can do, I can do this. I can put a breakpoint here, as you can see, right when it fails, and I can run it as debug, right? So it's going to fetch the, the containers, run them on my machine, and here it stopped, and I can go for this result, and I can click view and see this is what it has in this uh, installed in output, right? It tells me, see, that the, uh, something was pinned, see, because, it, it, because of the switch, and the full flag, it shows me where the virtual thread is pinned. So when it tells, basically, keep the engine running, okay? And I can scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, and here it is, see? It tells me, in greeting obtainer dot Java line 27, you are telling the driver of the platform thread uh, not to release yourself, basically. So here we go to greeting obtainer, and this is exactly it. See, line 27 is this. And it got pinned because it's inside synchronized method or block. So I guess after you switch your system to virtual thread, right, uh, you want to make sure that it's not pinning stuff. And you can do that in production, of course, and then monitor your logs. Or you can do that even before production. Americans call or say that this is a shifting to the left. I don't know why, but this is what they do. Shift to the left, meaning it shouldn't happen at, at CI. Uh, God forbid production. It should happen on developer's machine. So even before I do git, uh, commit, I should be able to see that this test is, is green, not red, right? So that they didn't degrade the performance or didn't misuse uh, virtual thread. Uh, yes. 
If you want to follow this experiment and see the code snippets and reasoning, it's on my uh, blog page, right? Uh, you can, you can, you're more than welcome the, to to follow this uh, and and clone and run. So uh, let's jump to another topic: uh, structured concurrency. Sorry, it's it's summer. Let me take a sip. It's summer already. Yes, very nice. So it's second incubator module in Java 20. This is the JEP. Uh, you can read it, and it's about having better idioms for multi-threaded code. Basically, uh, by the way, I'm not going to make any break. I mean, we are granted only 120 minutes, so I'm not going to take any breaks. Sorry. Uh, yes, because we don't have this async await, okay? And uh, we would also have um, no thread leaks or cancellation delays. Um, and uh, it should happen without touching the current concurrency stuff. Sorry. English, and uh, for now we're not replacing into interruption with uh, cancellation. Okay, so thread interrupt stays uh, as it was, right? At least for now, maybe in the future it will change, we shall see. And it works more or less like this, but since it's a deep dive and we have more time, let me show you a proper code example. Uh, it should be this. Very nice. So, let's say this is uh, some games. We have some games, right? And there's this big scoreboard, and we need to display people's names and their current score, okay? And we have two services. One can provide us with the usernames and their IDs, and another can provide us with user IDs and their score. So we have to call both services, get the results, and then combine them before we show them on the, on the board, okay? This is what we're supposed to do. Right? And this is what your PM uh, told you to do. So we have this name service, we have this score service, right? And how do we, we, how do we implement it uh, initially? We do it like the, the, the most rudimentary approach. Uh, we call one service and we call another service and then we combine the results and we present them, right? So let me run this thing. Uh, hopefully it does work. Yeah, if, you, if it doesn't, maybe you need to add uh, this thing. Uh, this thing to this uh, modify run configuration as uh, here uh, alt v okay uh, okay so it took two seconds okay and so you manage it comes and say and they say it's very nice uh, it, w it does uh, what it's supposed to do but it takes two seconds can you make it any faster and what do you do then Come on, developers. I, I've seen your developers, so. Yeah, we can run both of them like in parallel. So this is what we can do, and we can do for we can use, for example, futures for that, right? Uh, so we can like add more sugar to the code, and we can create new executors. And here I'm already using you see this virtual threads, right? So I have this executor using uh, try with resources, and I have. One future, uh, and I have another future. I'm waiting for, for, for the names, I'm waiting for the score, and then I'm combining the results, right? And how long do you think it will take? Sorry? Half the time. Who said half the time was the first one? Okay, you got jealous. I throw you catch, okay? It's not an exception, okay? You guys are like, don't be so scary. These are soft, okay? These are soft. Okay, catch. Oh. Yeah, you even speak Polish. Ah, super powers. You don't? Okay. Uh, maybe another day. Okay, let's run it. Let's run it and let's see if it works in half the time. Yes, uh, it takes more or less a second to f find out that Susan has 100, Joe has 100, and Krzysztof has 300, right? Krzysztof is for Polish for Christopher. Okay, and now, fun fact. Let's say these are microservices, so we're calling somewhere, someone over the wire, right? And sometimes when you call something over the wire, things might not work properly, right? So let's say we call this service and see it didn't do anything, it was sleeping. Don't do that at home, please. But let's say instead of even sleeping, it just goes bananas. And now my question is, how long will it take to run this program to know that we cannot display this scoreboard because we don't have the names? Sorry? One second, you say one second. Sorry? Two seconds. Can I get it lower? Can I get it higher? Okay. 
Okay, nobody. Let's nobody else. No, no other beats. Okay, let's see. And it takes one second. Very nice. You got your jellies. And why is that one second not uh, instantly? Some people may may ask. It's because if these things goes bananas, right? This thing doesn't know it should abandon what it's doing because it doesn't make any sense any longer, right? So what we could do, we could like sort of interconnect these futures, right, with the cancellation and basically say, hey, if the, if the service, if the name's future uh, uh, is, is, is not working, tell the other future. And if the score uh, future is not working, tell the name future, it's no point in continuing, right? Uh, so with two futures, it's quite easy, quite doable. Would you try it with four futures? And one future calling every other three futures. And then it's really, then we end up with callback hell, right? Uh, so it's doable, but it's not easy. So perhaps we can go for structured uh, approach, which is a new thing uh, to, to Java. Uh, you see, it looks almost the same. It's just this time we have this structured task scope. Okay, and uh, again, in now instead of submit, we have fork, and we have again this call, this call, and then we have to join. And if there are any exceptions, we want to we want these exceptions to be rethrown, and then we wait for the result here, here, and we combine them, right? And now when I when I run this thing, it takes. Okay, I forgot this. See, I forgot myself uh, to add this. I was I, I guess I didn't click like okay or something. Uh, stop, modify run configuration, alt v, yes, okay, and uh, let's try to rerun it. Yes, now it's using the incubator module, right? And see, now it fails almost instantly. So what we get for free with this structured concurrency is the cancellation mechanism. It was a great party. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, Yes, so when one of these two fails, it notifies the other ones created using this scope, hey, there's no point in waiting because it's shut down on failure. So I need each and every one of you to respond correctly in time, right? Um, yes, um, okay. And there's like how not to misuse this uh, approach. There is uh, this thing. Uh, yeah, so... We can forget, for example, to call... Okay, let's, let's do it like this uh, for now. Let me rerun. And it shows an exception, uh, blah, 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 wrong thread exception. It basically, what it says is this. You have called scope.fork not within the three. Tree, sorry, tree. In English, it's tree. Uh, un arbre, right? Yes. Uh, so the... Only threads who are allowed to call fork on this scope is the thread that created uh, this scope or any thread that is inside the fork, okay? So we have to go deeper, sort of this, I don't know, like a deeper and deeper style. Uh, and whenever you want to call uh, or uh, fork on, the th on this scope from any other thread than owning thread, it will throw you an exception, right? So please make sure you don't do anything like this. And even if you don't, you still need to remember about one more thing, which is calling join. Because if you don't call join, it will uh, tell you task completed with exception, right? So basically, you didn't, uh, you forgot to call, uh, it's yelling at you. It forgot to tell you, uh, sorry, it tells you that you forgot to call join on the scope or join until. Uh, righty, very nice. Let me fix the code back. Uh, yes. So this is it for structured concurrency. Yeah, free cancellation within the tree. There are two default uh, uh, task scopes. Uh, one is shutdown on failure that we've seen, and another is shutdown on success. Uh, for example, we have two cache systems, right, and database, and we need to, and let's say uh, we need for given username, uh, sorry, user ID, we need to get, have a username. So we can call one cache, another cache, and database concurrently, Right, and whoever responds as the first, we take this result, and we don't need to wait for any other one, okay? Because we assume that it's going to be still the same username. So then you can, for example, use this shutdown on success. Should you need anything else, you need to implement it on your own, okay? Uh, and don't forget to join uh, or join until, else you will see this exception I have just shown you uh, seconds before. And now scope values, very nice. 
Uh, any Star Trek fans in the room? Nobody. You're all Star Wars. Come on. Come on. Okay. So there's, another, there's the last thing to, to this um, concurrency, which is uh, scope values. And maybe you've been to this situation. Uh, so now we're going to have one-way immutable thread locals. Have you maybe been to this situation that you were debugging a system, right? Because let's say you work for a bank, uh, and then you've realized uh, that uh, in certain rather rare cases, it happens that someone logs into the bank application, and instead of seeing their accounts or statements, they see the accounts or statements of somebody else. And you dig in, dig in, you debug with your friends, maybe the half of the department, and then you discover that this, someone added, I, I don't know, like a few months ago, this extra call somewhere, putting like the credentials of the user to thread local, and you have these uh, threads in a pool, and uh, because of an uh, exception, you forgot, like, so I see some people, yeah, I've been there. Yeah. This is it. So thread locals are very nice, they are a very powerful solution, but they need to be handled with care. Right? Because they are mutable and they are not cleaned automatically. So you, you have to remember to clean them uh, sort of manually, right? Especially if the threat is not going to die but, but handle another task, right? So now we're going to have scope values, which are, I call them one way immutable threat locals. Because, fun fact, if you see a million virtual threats, right? And each virtual, th virtual threat should have its own copy of something then we'll have one million of copies, right? Which means more pressure for the garbage collector, more work, right? So maybe we need to have something that is just one instance and it's immutable, so all the virtual threads, the whole million, uh, can use the, the same instance, right? So this is it. And uh, it should be also easy to reason about the lifetime of the, of the thing here. So you just take a look at the source code and you instantly know it lives from here to here. Right? It doesn't leave, I don't know, two weeks after or something like this. And this should give us, in return, simplified reasoning and also improved perf performance because, fun fact, uh, immutable things usually perform better right? uh, when we have like, uh, just one write and many, many, many read operations. And uh, just for the record, thread local doesn't change or doesn't get deprecated. There are still valid use cases for thread locals, okay? So it's, it's still there, but we're going to have new thing called scoped uh, value. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, this is again uh, pseudocode, how it can work, but let me uh, show you like a proper code, okay? Where is the proper code? Come on, come here, come to daddy. Uh, here it is, very nice. Okay. So... Let's say we have a starship. Like, uh, but you guys, you've heard of Star Trek, right? You're familiar with like Live Long and Prosper. Yeah, okay, very nice. So let's say th there's one series, it's called Voyager, uh, right? So they were, it wasn't magic, mind you. Star Trek, it's never magic. Uh, they were transferred to the other end of the galaxy, and then they were supposed to come back home to our like, region of the Milky Way, right? And then, uh, let's say this is it, so this is the starship of ours, the Voyager, and uh, there are different characters, and the characters have different uh, like security or clearance levels, okay? Then here I'm emulating them only as, a, as an integer. So this is the scope value, and this is security clear clearance level, and I'm creating new instance pretty much or pretty similar as I would do with, the, with a thread local, right? And so usually I would get that, let's say, from a request, like the people uh, logged into our system, and we know this is an administrator, an operator, just an external user, something like this. So we have this clearance level, which should be, shouldn't be, I guess, an integer, but let's keep things simple for now. So this is the Voyager. And I say uh, where. So see, in this, in this scope, I'm saying where this clearance level is set to this, and I'm just using a random to get this, right? This is a demo. And then I tell the character to do random stuff on our starship. And the random stuff is more or less like this. I can turn lights off and on always. Even if I'm in a prison, in a brig, right? I can always turn lights on and off. So it's not checking my, my, my uh, access levels. But uh, when I want to locate another crew member, I need to have security level of at least two, right? And so, it, which means if I'm not a prison, I can ask the computer, hey, who, where is that, that, that other person, right? And uh, also, I can block uh, bridge controls when I'm a captain, okay? So I need to be a captain, which is just 
10 or above, right? Uh, so ordinary crew members uh, aren't able to block bridge uh, controls, okay? So this is what I, what I can do. Uh, yeah, uh, so let's uh, run this code. Oops, it's gonna run previous demo, sorry. Uh, let's run this code. Uh, and see the output again. I forgot to add this, or maybe it got cleared. I mean, it gets cleared every now and then. So modify run configuration this thing because it's still uh, as in incubator module come on here very nice now it worked okay so let's see what has happened right so it it gave me a level of seven right uh, okay so i'm here and i'm doing some stuff here right so i when i can turn and see i'm using a uh, structured concurrency here the, the, the previous example right so i can turn the lights on i can locate the commander to voc and I can block the, the I cannot bridge the block, uh, uh, sorry, uh, bridge controls. As you can see, insufficient security level, it says. And now let's say our character was put to prison and it happens like this. Inside this where block, I can go deeper and set, say, like, remove the, like, all the privileges. Let's say you're a prisoner now. You can only turn the lights on and off, nothing more. Right? And when I'm doing some stuff here, you see it says security clearance level zero. I can turn lights on, uh, but I can't do anything else. And then when this block finishes, right, it's bound back to this old security clearance, clearance level. Right? So then again, I have this security level seven, and I can turn lights on. It seems Commander Tuvok teleported to uh, deck three now, not 16. And I, I'm still not a captain. Right, so this is it. So this is how the reasoning is simpler. Uh, right, I just take a look at the code, and there are calls from inside this block, pretty much like with try with resources. Right, we know try with resources since Java 7, and this is this the same thing on like for immutable uh, thread locals. Um, yes, and I really suggest you call like or else because it might not be set, for example, uh, or, or like uh, you want to throw an exception or have a default value, something like this. Uh, yes, so they work nicely with structured concurrency. You can call run if the thing is void, like I did, or if you uh, need like to have a result, something, then you have to call uh, call, as the name implies. And as you've seen, words can be nested, uh, right? Like the uh, Matryoshka style. So there is like a deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, okay, now we jump quite conveniently after one hour, we jump to processing data. All right, so we're diving uh, now deep in uh, slightly different waters, right? We, we stop the concurrency, we are going to process data. So, Java 17 people and above, are you using records? Very nice, records, uh, which can be described briefly as immutable, transparent data carriers. And they are better in certain ways than Java beans because First, they're immutable, and second, which is even more important, they are not convention, they are not gentleman agreement that we should have a prefix that is said, and then the prefix that is get, is, was, has been, perhaps, or what not, right? Uh, there's accessor that doesn't have any prefixes, and the whole thing is described in Java language specification. That's the beauty of it, right? Uh, therefore, it can be used in another uh, language construct, and we start uh, seeing this, uh, this thing now, uh, right now. Okay, and it, in Java, it might be not easy to handle data first flows, uh, especially if you're, even if you're not using like Java 16, because this thing is Java 16 or above, because I'm using this, uh, some call it smart casting, right? Like the, the, in Kotlin, I guess it was called smart casting, right? So in Java 11, it's even one more line because I would need to cast here uh, the line casting uh, object to an event, right? So you see, I have uh, quite a few uh, lines to just check if this field has a value uh, at least uh, that big or bigger than this, right? Else I want to do something else. And this is like a tedious way. Uh, and uh, like many, many years ago, uh, a friend of mine told me that Java is language for scribblers, right? People who, who like to talk and write a lot uh, without like a lot of, so there's like a, uh, noise to to signal ratio is 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 not good basically. It's a question. Instead of not much processing, uh, 
So the question is, if Lombok resolved this problem, I've been asked this question a number of times, so I am prepared, and the, my answer will be this. You go to softwaregarden.dev, okay, you go to posts, and then you scroll for what do I think about Lombok, and here's my answer. Okay, sorry, sorry for doing it this way, but I don't want to derail this talk because we don't have like another hour to discuss Lombok, sorry. Uh, yes, so I've, I've been there, I've answered that. Thanks for raising this up. It means, uh, makes my, 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 my efforts for this blog like, uh, really uh, meaningful. Okay, so here it comes, pattern matching for Switch. Uh, as a full preview in Java 20, and the thing is, good or Switch remains the same. Meaning, if you compile your code and you suddenly discover that now you didn't touch your switch, but it behaves differently than it used to in previous Java versions, it means you found a bug, right? And then you, of course, notify OpenJDK folks, hey, you feel like a bug report, I found like a bug or something. I doubt it will happen, but in case it happens, you know that it shouldn't have happened, okay? And uh, no coloring here because JavaScript doesn't understand this code, but you've seen this code, right? Uh, and, 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 and this is how it looks in a, in a nutshell, right? So now it's uh, more null friendly. Instead of having this guard above, if it's, if it equal, if it's equal to null, uh, do something else, this uh, switch, when I pass it to null, will throw me null pointer exception or something, right? So I can decide I don't want to have null pointer exception, I want to have another exception. Right, uh, because why not? Or I want to like uh, have like a uh, merge it with default or something, and uh, then I can have uh, like go for. See, I'm I'm passing it an object. That's the point. I'm passing an object, and then I can check. I can use some call uh, so-called guard, right? And then I can check if this uh, thing matched here is meeting cert certain criteria, right? Uh, so if, it, if it's at least 17, I can say, hello, this is Java, and then this, this thing. And then if it's not at least 17, I can go for, like, but how? Right? Fun fact, it wouldn't compile in Java 17 or 18, because in Java 17, they didn't have when they had uh, two ampersands, like end end. Right? So it, it wouldn't work in 17, anyhow. And we have uh, still, of course, uh, default. Uh, so how does it work? Switch can be now friend more now friendly now. Uh, and handles objects, okay? This is the, the whole concept of pattern matching, that there is, like, uh, the patterns come in, or the thing that has to be matched come as objects, right? Uh, not just primitives. Uh, dominant cases uh, aren't allowed by a compiler. We'll get to that. Uh, cases can contain guards, as you've seen this, at least 17. This is a guard. Sealed classes don't need default. If you have sealed classes or interfaces, which you should have if you have, like, a nice domain, uh, starting Java 17, uh, then you don't need to have this default um, check. Pattern matching still doesn't work with primitives. It might work in one of the Java future Java releases, but it's not now. Now you can use only auto-boxing, but that means um, uh, performance penalty, right? And both switch expressions and instructions work using uh, pattern matching. And pattern matching doesn't allow fall through. Let me show you a quick demo. I, I should go to another module now. And so you, you're more than welcome to uh, clone this stuff and, and see uh, like uh, on your own um, how does it work, uh, right? Uh, I don't know, with, with your colleagues at work or I don't know, when you have this lovely Friday evening. I don't know what you guys do on Friday evenings. Um, anyway, let's run this code because in code we trust, very nice. It works, <laughs> that's already something, right? Uh, yes, so as I told you, switch instruction remains, right? So it's still the same thing, and nothing changed here, uh, or nothing changed here, like in Java 14 style with these arrows, uh, right? The arrow style is still the same, and switch can now handle nulls. Uh, so as you can see, I can add here case null, right? So instead of having if now I can have something like this. Uh, and uh, yes, I can combine null with the default, right? I can have something like this. And fun fact, it has to be in exact this order as of Java 20. Previously, I could play with the order or, or, or mix null with like, for example, empty string. Now it's only the default that it can be uh, sort of like put together, 
Okay, maybe it makes sense. Uh, and of course, switch uh, expressions also work like this, and maybe it's easier to see it like this, right? Uh, that tells you null a thing. We should we should have like a C uh, null and uh, yeah, a thing empty null. So this is it. And now it can also handle different types. Oops, sorry, we are here. Uh, so yes, this is where it starts shining. Right, so I can check if the thing that was passed to me is a string, is an integer, is a long, is an, like an array, for example, uh, and or if it's something else. And and it tells me here. See, uh, it's like a, come on, make it bigger. Uh, that it's a string, an integer, a long, something else, or it's a array of doubles. Right. Uh, so, any questions? I guess it makes sense. Oh, there's a question. Uh -huh, this side. Yeah, the question is if it's if it's casted uh, here already. I I think I have an answer here, uh, but yeah, let, let, let's see. See, I can go for and say uh, length or formatted. You see, it's string. It's casted already. That's the whole point of it, right? So when I have it at hand. And when I get matched here, uh, here I'm playing with a string and, uh, and the compiler already knows it's a string. It can't be anything else. It's not an object. It doesn't require casting, right? Yes. Um, and then uh, the dominant cases aren't allowed. So if I try to do this, you see even IntelliJ tells me it's not going to work. Why isn't, isn't it going to work? Because the string is serializable, of course. So if it got matched here, there's no chance it's going to be here. It's like catching exception here and catching uh, runtime exception here, right? Of course it won't work because every runtime exception is an exception. The, and every string is serializable in Java, at least uh, until we, as long as we have serialization in a current shape. Uh, we'll see for how long. Uh, yeah, so that's why it's not allowed. However, I could do the following. Uh, gosh, I mean, if I was playing properly with the mouse, uh, keyb keyboard, I mean, yeah? I can go this way. So this is most specific or more specific case than this, right? So this is, uh, if, if I put them in a, in a different order, then this case is dominant case regarding this case, okay? So dominant cases aren't allowed, at least when uh, the compiler can tell these are dominant cases, all uh, right? Uh, we can go with patterns now. Uh, yeah, so that was the code that we could use in Java 16. And now, and here's the answer to your question, I guess, uh, even better. See, uh, something like this. Uh, we can use this, we, uh, these guards, right? So string, when it's a uh, length is at least three, I say a string that has at least three characters, right? Or you're a positive integer, or you're a two-digit long, or you're in an array, don't do that, okay? Don't do that. Don't compare doubles using equals equals, okay? Especially if you're working at bank. Uh, all right? If you're working at bank, just forget about doubles, okay? You don't keep money at, as doubles. Don't. Um, yes. Uh, so this is how it works. Uh, and it should be... See, it says you're a string at least three characters long. You're a positive integer. Yeah, so it, the code was working. And uh, yeah, so the dominant cases uh, here as well. I, I, if, I can also like switch it like this, of course, because it won't work. That would be silly. Uh, the, with sealed classes, I happen to have a sealed interface here, which, as you can see, has only three possible children. So final class, record, or non-sealed class. Right, but these are the only things that are permitted, and because they exist in a single file, this so single source file, I don't have to go for the uh, permits and then list uh, list them like uh, sorry, uh, like uh, final class and so on. That would be needed if they were in different source uh, files, right? Right, but since they are in the same, I don't have to. Uh, so these are the three possible options, right? There is no other option that, that then when I want to use default, even IntelliJ, it's, it's telling me, hey, that it makes no sense to use default, right? We don't, ex we don't expect anything else than this and this and this. Sorry, than this or this or this, right? It's like a sort of like triple exclusive or, uh, right? Uh, and we cannot use primitives, of course. Uh, so this is like the good old switch, right? But I can't use anything like this. As of now, in future Java versions, that might be possible. I've seen some uh, draft jabs, right? Uh, this doesn't work now. 
uh, right? What works is uh, using uh, auto boxing, but I'm not sure if you want to go uh, this way, uh, right? Also because like uh, if it's an integer, uh, then it's also going to be a long. This might be messy, right? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go this uh, this way, and uh, yeah. Uh, they also had uh, switch instructions also had uh, handle patterns. It's only I have to use uh, like returns or breaks, like here or here, else it doesn't work. Why? Because normally switch instruction is fall through in Java, right? So what would it mean? What would it mean uh, if I match or alias uh, FC here and then fall through to this branch? Bless you. It wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, do any sense. Just like catching exceptions, right? If you catch this thing, it can't fall through to another catch block, right? Because then it's unbound, uh, of course, uh, right? That's why it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. And for the last case, I don't have to go for like break or return or anything because it's obvious it's, it's going to end, right? And uh, yeah, I don't need any defaults and anything because it's a sealed uh, thingy. And there's one thing. Uh, it's I'm not the author of this. Uh, this comes from the for the Dimitri from uh, yeah Dimitri Alexandrov from Bulgaria, and he he came with something like this. When you have a class which is like uh, called when, when it has a method called when which is boolean, then you can have something like this. Um, right, Dimitri is like a very resourceful guy. See, so you can go for when 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 then when when. Whatever that gives you. <laughs> That's a dad joke, right? That's a dad joke. Yeah, I can like I should put it like here or like not case default because it also changed like something like this. See, it it compiles, right? It compiles. Uh, very nice. Uh, yeah. So we've covered that, and now let's go to record pat record patterns, uh, which play or go together very nicely with uh, with uh, uh, mm, pattern matching for switch. Right, records. If you keep using records, right, you can have a value, for example, just to wrap an ordinary number, and you, we can have complex numbers. If you if you didn't do like algebra or whatever it is at university, basically a complex number is something that you can have square root of minus one, and it will give you i, right? Something like this, uh, or you can think it's like of a two-dimensional point. Basically, so there's like x, x axis, epsilon axis, or y axis, right? Yeah. So uh, let's say we can have records like these. Maybe I could, I should, let's switch to the code. Like, you people, why don't you tell me to switch to code? Uh, code is obviously better. Uh, yes, this thing. Okay. Let's see if it runs. First, we need to check if it runs. If it doesn't, what's the point of bothering us ourselves? Okay. It'll run like this, okay. Uh, it relies on, on the random, right? And we tell, give me something. And the give me something can give us like an object and it can be a value or a complex, right? We don't know, or it can be uh, a string, because why not? And then we can check if it's S is instant, if this something is instant of, instance of value, and then we can, as you can see, sort of deconstruct the object, decompose it, and see if inside this record this value is called v. And fun fact, it's not super strict here because this uh, field can be called value and I'm here matching only against uh, v, right? So I, I alias this or like uh, rename it as v. And then I can basically call v here. And maybe it shines even better here. So when I uh, match it against being a complex, having two values, I can go for like right, uh, real value and imaginary value like this, right? Or I can go deeper. I mean, if it's a record composed of records and so on, then I can go, let's check this real value and, and, and uh, imaginary value even better. And then, as you can see, I don't need to call this dot value uh, accessors, right? Uh, it's, it's simpler than this. Let's rerun this code. Uh, because I'd like to get the compacts. Okay, let's see, that's something else. Uh, come on, be complex, be complex. Okay, finally. See, so um, this worked and this worked. So this is the first call and the second call. And the third call comes from this. Right, so as you can see, I can have pattern matching 
uh, again uh, with switch, uh, right? And then I can say case value uh, something like uh, this, right? Uh, or I can match complex like this or like this. Uh, I can go for var. No, I can't. I can't have any something like this. It, it has to be precise uh, type, at least as of now. Uh, and uh, I guess this may raise another question. If I let's say uh, in this complex example, I don't care. Uh, I care only about the real value, right? So how can I ignore the imaginary value, right? Right now. You can't. So the shortest thing you can do is call basically var uh, underscore underscore, right? Just sort of ignore it because single underscore uh, has been banned a few years ago, right? And it was banned because in the future Java releases, it's going to happen as a preview feature in Java 21, if I'm not mistaken, we'll be able to write something like this just to ignore this part, right? So we basically care only about real part of the complex, not imaginary part of the complex, right? For example, as of now, as of Java 20, it's uh, still uh, required to go full way, or you can go like, I don't know, ignore, if you want to ignore it, right? Uh, yes, my question was, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it compile? Yeah, it's the same thing, therefore, it's, it sounds silly, but this thing dominates this thing, right? It's, a, it's a, like we, what we saw in, with the previous thing. It's, it's like a matching the, the same, so the same thing also dominates the same thing. Uh, pink or yellow? Okay. Ah, almost, sorry. Yellow, okay, yes. And as you can see, I can match something like this, and I can use it, and then I can even go with this when, for example, r bigger than i. See? So both JEPs work very nice together. And when you have to process data and you keep this data as record, suddenly Java becomes so much useful uh, and so much shorter and, and, and easy, easier to read and reason about, right? So Scala people, Kotlin people, even Python people are saying like, yes, mission accomplished. Uh, yes, very nice. Um, I'm not sure if we shall go deeper with this. Uh, I just describe you what's what's happening here. Uh, if you want to like play with uh, more with this, uh, basically, uh, it's the the compiler tries to reason about, and I mean, I mean how the exhaustive the check of the type is, right? And uh, if you happen to have uh, something, see, we're gonna have a generic complex that's just n. Uh, it doesn't know, for example, that I'm using integers or doubles only, whereas uh, where I go for like the record that is using seal type, right? It's then I don't need to have defaults or these extra cases because see here I need to have five to make this work, whereas uh, when I'm using the seal types, uh, this seal one, I need only four ones, right? That's why sealing your, your sorry, not seal types, seal, sealed classes or interfaces, right? That's why if you're on Java 17 or above and you're creating, for example, your domain events or something like this, I really recommend using uh, sealed uh, classes. I was describing them in like my, you should, like, if you're interested, go to like YouTube and look for like uh, what's new and noteworthy for Java 17, basically. Um, yes, because we don't have that much time. So record patterns allow deconstructing records, as you've seen, right? So I can I have, have like something uh, opposite. Sorry, once again, who's doing Scala? Just two, three, sort of three people. Okay, so just for you, in Java, we can't write, as of now, an apply uh, method, right? Uh, we have to rely on records uh, only. Uh, so in Scala, there are case classes, but we can also create or write an apply method, sort of deconstructor. Uh, for other types, uh, it's impossible in Java as of now. Uh, so we can uh, allow deconstructing these records with nesting, no other types for now, and it works as you've seen both with ifs and switches. And let's go to the last chapter for today, which is uh, working with native stuff. Um, 
Because native stuff can be really unsafe, right? This was the reason for the big cry and the big drama when Java 9 was about to be released, and then it was postponed, and then it was postponed, and then it was postponed, I don't know, for, for, uh, for a few more months and so on. So it got postponed like too many times, right? Because people were not uh, uh, like um, ready to abandon uh, SunDisk Unsafe because uh, somehow when they saw the name of the class, it didn't click in their mind that this class is unsafe to use. I mean, how could they know, right? <laughs> of course. So native stuff can be really unsafe in three aspects, in time, in range, and when it comes to threading, okay? Uh, it can be tedious because you have to write all these .h files, .o files, you have to compile them, recompile them, you need to make sure that your Java code is in sync with your C code and so on. It can be really tedious, right? Like a monk job, basically. Uh, it's also limited to a certain degree, for example, byte buffer. So if I'm not mistaken, you can't keep more than two gigabytes uh, in French, two giga octets. Uh, of data because uh, index out of range exception, right? And and it can be really slow, so we want it to be at least as fast as Java native uh, uh, invocations, right? Not slower. So there are so now it's uh, I don't know two jabs, no one jab. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, just one jab. That used to be two jabs uh, uh, or just two incubator modules in the past. Now it's just one foreign function and memory API. And it looks innocent as second preview feature in Java 20, but if I'm not mistaken, it was like for four times incubator module before, which means we saw it as incubator or incubating or being in preview for six releases already. And some people say, it's so long, why can't they release it already? And I say, it's very fortunate it takes so long because we don't want to, I mean, we, let's do it once for good instead of having another optional .get, right? and other joys of API. Uh, yes, so what are the building blocks of this foreign memory uh, API? It's memory segment, right? So it, it's basically a piece of memory that we're going to handle or operate uh, with. And now I have a question to you. How many dimensions does memory have in our computers? One, who says two? Okay, so two. May I have three? Okay, there's just one dimension. Yeah, it's, it's linear. The memory starts here and goes on, right? If, if someone shows you a memory in a computer as, as a table, excuse my French, they know shit. Just as data isn't kept in a cylinder, right? Database architects or various architects, they, 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 they love to draw the data. If it's a cylinder in the diagram, you, you know it's a data store, right? For like database, because in the good old days, they used to be like, a, I don't know, wax cylinders or something like this, or magnetic cylinders. It's not the case anymore, right? So the memory is always linear. Therefore, a memory address is just uh, like, a, like a point in this, in this, in this line, right? Um, and there's memory layout. For example, if I have a structure, uh, anyone working with uh, C or, or Go uh, or any other uh, structural language? Yeah, a few people. Okay, so if you don't know, structures in these languages are more or less like objects without uh, any methods or functions. Just basically, you, you, you create a structure. How do you organize your data, right? So you may have a structure, and this structure might have three fields. For example, first field can be an integer, a uh, second po uh, field can be like a float number, and the third point, uh, 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 field can be another structure of any other type, right? And then the whole concept of layout is to like, say uh, that this, uh, for example, in this memory segment, starting at this address, uh, I have this memory layout, and the memory there is kept in such structures. So, for example, when I need second field of the third structure in this layout, I don't need to take a, an envelope right, or a napkin and calculate the address to make a hit there and know if it's big endian or little endian integer, right? I just can use indexes and say, give me third element and then a second field from there, right? Sort of, more or less. I mean, 
I'm oversimplicating, but you get the idea. And then there is a arena and a segment scope. It provides us boundary as for time and thread, and it works really nicely with thread, uh, trifold resources. And we can also use var handles for that. Let me show you the code because code is obviously much better than just slides. I mean, I can put anything on slides, right? Uh, whereas it has to compile here, and here it is. Yes, okay, uh, very nice. So uh, this is the demo for a single thread. So I'm going to create a memory layout being a sequence layout of just 10 Java integers, right? Uh, and because I say allocate native, it's going to be off heap, meaning the garbage collector is not going to play with that, okay? It's not going to like, uh, well, play with that, right? And then I say open shared, and open shared means that all threads would be, more or less all threads will be able to access that, uh, that uh, memory segment. So I have the memory segment, and here I'm trying to populate, so put stuff there, and then I'm going to see what's, what's inside there, right? So uh, it's really easy. You see, I have this memory segment, like uh, in here, right? And I have this, uh, this layout, so I know like, what kind of data I keep inside. Uh, so it can be uh, really easy like this. The easiest approach is, as you can see, I have a for loop, so I, have, I know how many elements I have, right? And I can just iterate, and I can set something at a given index, uh, and I can say uh, at this index, so this is the index, this is the value, I'm just going to put zero and the index zero, one and the index one, and so on, just to keep it simple, right? Uh, or I can use uh, var handles if you're var handle fun boys and fun girls, uh, right? Something like this. So both will work, and then I can see what's happening inside. So I can examine the memory at the given and, uh, ag uh, address. I can check if my current uh, thread can access this scope, right? And then I can still use uh, var handle to read the data from this native memory, mind you. Um, or I can go basically like this, segment, at index, yes, so let's, let's try to run it. Uh, let's try to run it. Very nice. And it seems to be, yeah. So we are examining memory living here. It can be accessed by, uh, by this thread. I mean, usually if, if a thread creates this uh, segment, it can access it, right? That's quite what I would expect. Uh, and still, you uh, see, we populated it and we examined that this is what I expected. It's really simple, uh, simple stuff, right? But uh, for example, let's say I made this mistake, this off by one error, right? And here I'm putting less or equal, right? And let's rerun it. And now it yells at me, see? It tells me, hey, 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 hey. Like, see, it calculated the offset. It calculated how many bytes it, it can go. And now it tells me, hey, you, hey, what are you trying to do? You, 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 you cross the boundary, right? It's not safe. Please don't go that. Please don't do that. So this is really nice because as you can see, when I'm creating this stuff, the, the magic number, which should be a constant actually, and according to like good clean code uh, style, right? Uh, happens to uh, happen only once in here. Then I don't have to put it uh, again as 10 in here or, or like when I uh, examine the memory. Then I'm just relying on the element count. So the layout knows how many elements it has inside, right? So and now as you can see, if you need to keep something off the heap, like in native memory, it's really easy. It's, it's much safer. And now let's go for two, uh, two threads like this. And now I'm opening the arena as confined, meaning the thread that opened this uh, or reserved this native memory is able to play with it, but not the other threads, right? And let's see if that's really the case. Uh, so I have this other thread, right? And I want this other thread to be able to uh, see what's inside this memory. So let's run it. And it says, no, 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 no. Attempted access outside owning thread. So see, we had checked that the boundaries are saved, that the threads are saved, right? And now let's see the, the last uh, thing that's also uh, preserved. Um, uh, which is uh, closing this arena. See, I was relying on trying with, with resources, and here I'm trying to close this arena like manually, and let's see if I can examine this memory. And fun fact, I can't because it says it's already closed. 
So it's also time boundary that's checked, right? And as you can see, I didn't have to write any single character in C code. It all happened in Java. And you might be asking yourself, uh, let me just put it back to previous state. Why do we need this? Why do we need this scope, which is even like uh, simplified? See, I was able to create this uh, int array layout, right? Open it confined, meaning only for this thread, and I can now allocate it native, and then I can basically use this index to set an index and get that index, right? It's it's even simpler. Uh, it's uh, it's needed for this, for calling stuff. So if you call native stuff, like in C, it's not going to put data back to your Java heap, right? It's going to put it off the heap. So if you're calling some native functions, you need to access what they have uh, created for you, or you need to prepare data for, for this code to work. For example, if you, if you, if you have like some super fancy algorithm uh, in C, uh, like much better when it comes to sorting, right? Uh, also a preview feature, and uh, it aims to replace JNI with pure Java development model. Again, no .o, no .h files, anything like this. Uh, right now, it supports only C for these architectures, but in the future, it might get extended, for example, for C++ as well. And yeah, the performance shouldn't be worse than JNIs. And what this linker allows, it allows us two things, so-called down calls and up calls. And what's the difference? Down call is relatively simple. You have a function in C, and you want to call it from Java, so you call it, and it gives you a result. And they live happily ever after. And sometimes, like with this sorting, you have, for example, very nice comparator written in Java, but this sorting algorithm uh, is written in C. So what you want to do is going to tell C code to sort the data using, like calling up again to Java using this Java's comparator. Hence, it's called up call, right? Uh, so let me quickly show you uh, the, the down call. Uh, do you folks know this guy? I'm going to butcher his family name. Brian Vermeer, the, the, the sneak guy about security, Java, deserialization issues, exploits, and whatnot. Okay. If you, if you don't know him, I recommend watching uh, his talks. Uh, because one thing we shouldn't be doing is we shouldn't be running our applications as root, right? So uh, instead of making sure or, or, or putting this burden on our DevOps folks, we can make this logic part of our Java system, basically. So our Java program, when it starts, it can check its current UID that it's, uh, I mean, the, of the user that's running this program, right? And it can say, it can check if it's root. And if it's root, it can say, no, 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 uh, please don't run me as root and exit with code 42, right? And how does this check how getting this UID is happening? So previously we were using MX beans and whatnot, and now we can do something like this. First, we, can, we have to be friends with this uh, lovely Spanish guy called Manuel. Do you know this Spanish guy, Manuel? Be friends with Manuel. R read what it writes you. I know it's a bad joke, but I... Yeah, so we get this native linker, right? And from the native linker, we get standard library. And then I'm telling it, like, look, it's going to be this uh, get UID um, function, right? And sort of, I need to tell it what's the signature of this function. So let's say it's going to return me Java short, right? Uh, and then I create this uh, down call handle and I invoke it, right? And this is it. And you might be saying, okay, very nice, you created this demo and it will run on your machine because you are running Linux, but it won't, despite we are in a BSD room, which is very funny, uh, but it won't work on my machine because I have like um, uh, Mac or Windows or something. Like, how do I test it? Again, there's a very, very useful shortcut in IntelliJ. And it's called, at least on Mac, or oh, sorry, Linux, Control Shift T, right? Uh, on Mac, it's this, this, and T. I don't know what these are. I mean, it's shift options T, let's say. And it will take you to an existing test 
for your code. And if the code doesn't exist, it can allow you to create a new test. So if you do PRs, PR reviews on your machine, you basically open this class, Control Shift T. If you don't see any class, I mean, any test, it means that the, uh, it's already rejected, right? Because no test, so how can I review it? Obviously. Uh, yes, and I'm going to test it uh, again in a similar fashion as before, right? So I'm going to create a Java container. I'm putting my stuff, my stuff there, the, 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 the executable I created, and then I'm starting it, see? And then I check the exit code if it's zero, and if it's not zero, I check if the standard output contains, uh, oh, sorry, I, I check if it's zero, and I also uh, make sure that the standard error doesn't say don't run me as a root, right? So let's, uh, let's run this thing. Uh, let's run this thing. Uh, yeah, so it says should not work for uh, root because by default it's running stuff as root, right? So then I see that the exit code was, I can put a breakpoint here again and let's debug this. Uh, so see the, yeah, the exit code is 42 and it uh, wrote, uh, oh no, please don't run me as root. So it behaved just as we expected. When it's running as root, it doesn't run. So sort of, it, it just stops uh, instantly, just as we desired in here. So if it's, if it's root, stop and complain, or complain and stop, shall I say. See, so you can test even such stuff with test containers. So please don't tell me that uh, oh, these tests are difficult. They are, they are not, not anymore. And you can test them. There's the whole family of libraries for Go, for JavaScript, for Python, even for Rust, apparently. So if they need integration tests in Rust, it seems that Rust isn't that secure and safe as they were advertising it, but never mind. Uh, okay, some uh, various things to conclude this, uh, this talk. By the way, you really, uh, I mean, I know it's hot in this room. I see you guys uh, like uh, trying to make like a breeze, uh, right? So thanks for staying so long. This is one of the reasons why you want to update or upgrade your JDK that you're using in production, right? Even if you still uh, compile your code and it still is, uh, still is in a source code compatibility for Java 8, for example, right? There is no reason preventing you to, even you, you don't have to recompile your jars, right? Just put them or run them using new JDK because you can have better garbage collectors, right? which are more efficient, which are faster, uh, and so on. So it, it, this means basically more, uh, like less resources, so more money saved. Uh, and also like the environment benefits are like um, important, I would say. Um, who has issues with their application starting to slow? I mean, the Java application. Okay, you folks are using Spring or what? Uh, sometimes, if your application starts slowly, and it's because it's so huge and it has so many classes, it's, uh, it's really worth to take a look at this and the concept called CDS Archive. So basically, you can create this archive and tell your uh, JDK when, when the virtual machine starts, uh, hey, instead of scanning the whole class path again, just use this cache. Okay, and this, uh, as you can see, gets easier and easier with every, almost every Java release. So it got also improved for Java 20, uh, right? And we also had Unicode 14 and 15 uh, implemented. So now we have even more emojis, should we had not enough in the past. Yeah, I know, sorry. And I have, of course, there are also other characters. It's a new, a new, new Unicode is not only about um, uh, emojis, right? But as an extra thing, we get, Priorities, okay, yeah, of course. Uh, turns out that for 28 years we were writing stuff to standard output and standard error like savages, my friends, because we didn't know what encoding that was. We assumed we knew. Now there are two new system properties that can tell us what's the encoding of standard output and standard error. You can check and then you can set proper encoding in your writer. I see you laughing. I mean, yeah, somehow we managed to survive, but now it's going to be easier. Uh, yes, there are additional date time formats, uh, right? Uh, so if you need to have like a, a new language uh, according to your locality, something like, uh, like in the afternoon, uh, you can have it, have it printed by Java. 
uh, there are new methods to create pre-allocated hash maps and hash sets. I don't know if I have this in this Java 20 or uh, not. Maybe that was for Java 19. Let's see if I have something. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. No, I don't. That was Java, uh, Java 19. Basically, let's say you're creating, when your application starts, you're creating a hash map of 1,000 elements, right? And, and you create in this uh, hash map, and then you uh, add more elements. So then it has to grow. And when it grows, sometimes it's like the capacity is reached, so we have to create, or, or the, like the API has to create a new map for you, bigger one, so all the elements are rewritten, the old object it has to be garbage collected, and so on and so on, right? So now, if you know up front, I'm gonna use 1,000 1, elements, you can create a hash map or hash set with exactly this capacity. So it's, it won't be growing while you populate it, okay? It will be of that size instantly, ready to accumul uh, accumulate all the objects uh, or items you have. Uh, some stuff got deprecated, uh, like locally constructors or URL constructors. Now we call locally.off and you create URLs using URI and then you call like to URL, if I'm not mistaken. Some stuff got removed. So it was never a wise idea on thread to call suspend, resume, and stop. But now also in this platform threads, if you call one of these methods, you will get unsupported operation exception as of Java 20. So they are the same as in uh, virtual threads, right? And if you need to compile your stuff uh, to be binary compatible with Java 7, it's not going to work with Java 20. Maybe it's about time, I don't know. Uh, what will happen in the future? Uh, interesting stuff will happen in the future, and there's no way I'm going to cover Java 21 alone, I guess, using two, uh, oh, just in two hours. See how much jeps, how many jeps we're going uh, to have, right? Um, it's going to be more, way more. Uh, yes, and they are like uh, beefy ones, I would say. Um, sorry, this window. Yeah, so we're going to have string templates. Uh, basically, we'll be able to like uh, do very nice things. Like, in, for example, in Scala, you have this uh, S, and then we're using dollars, something like to include. So we, we, there will be no need or less need to use string builders or string buffers, basically, right? Something like this. And you guys uh, see your faces like, oh, finally. Yeah. It took them a, a quarter of a century, finally. Uh, sequence collections, record patterns, as you can see, a standard feature, pattern matching, a standard feature, so it won't be like this dash dash and a little bit preview, it will be standard thing, right? And this might be the biggest change, I uh, spoiled this, but it seems that uh, virtual threads uh, are going to be regular slash standard feature as of Java 21, not structured concurrency, for example, but, but virtual threads, yes, uh, yes, and uh, this thing is going to also be um, uh, standard feature, oh sorry, no, a preview, like who knows this thing? Who knows this code? Everyone, okay. Who tried to explain like uh, super juniors or wannabe um, uh, programmers, Java developers, look, you need to have public and class, and sorry, I also forget static here, uh, and you also have to have these square brackets and whatnot because trust me, you, you, you'll understand that in time. Now it's just let's put this ceremony, right? Exactly. We've all been there because we've all started learning Java, I mean, one point in time, right? So it will get simpler, you see, without these uh, publics and statics and whatnot, and we won't have this argument, right? This would be simpler. And even if we have uh, like uh, this uh, dot JavaScript script, sort of, right? Uh, we'll be able to use like this single file program, we'll be able to use just this without any classes. Yeah, so cool. So we'll be able to write just scripts in Java, really like in .java files. Uh, okay, um, my question, do you have this uh, devox slash vox app, right? This, is there an app? So I don't know. Uh, th there's that app, right. So my question is to always and for everyone, at, not just at this lovely conference, but at every conference, at every meetup, right, every training, provide feedback. Uh, to the organizers, to the speakers, to the trainers, so they know what was good, what wasn't good, how to improve uh, for the next time and anything. Because 
you're doing this for yourself, okay? You're paying your future you a favor because next time you'll get better content, okay? And better prepared speakers and, and, and trainers and whatnot. So today I accept feedback in any form, can be even a paper form, but please use this, this app as the default. If you cannot use this app because reasons, or you're watching us on YouTube, even, I don't know, several uh, weeks uh, or months later, the link is somewhere here. I don't know how this is going to be composed, the video. Uh, so please uh, use this link to, this is like anonymous uh, uh, Google Forms uh, survey. I don't know who you are, but as a default, if you're here, please use this application. Um, all right, still people taking pictures. Okay, uh, that would be it. Okay, that's it, folks. Here are the links uh, for this uh, talk and for this uh, code. Should you want to follow me for more IT insights, for some Java tips, or basically pool life advices, uh, please use uh, Twitter or uh, Mastodon. And the the whole link for the oh, okay, so take, taking pictures, all right. And the whole link for everything that happened today is this, okay? So if you just scan this and send it to your friends, it has the code, the slides, uh, the, all the links I use, all the jabs, all the readmes and whatnot. Uh, I'm still here till the end of the day. It was really lovely to get us all up to speed with uh, modern Java. Please enjoy the break, please enjoy the conference, and please enjoy the fest tonight. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we have time for questions, but I, I thought I, I told you there's going to be no break. But if you want to have like enjoy your coffee earlier, you can do that. Or if you want to ask some questions in public, of course, uh, I can answer also like, questions in, in private. It's up to you.